Good evening, and welcome to the Pork Fried Rice Presents. No, no. <laughs> uh, this is the last uh, episode of the Taco Society Presents, and it's going to be uh, a little bit different from what you've normally seen before. Uh, this will be uh, our last show, my last show. There'll be tears. Nobody cares, yeah. No, I said tears. tears. Oh, tears. I oh, care. Yeah. I care. <laughs> he cares. There will be tears. <laughs> yes, oh, that's okay. it. Uh, uh, Phil and Sid uh, did a great job, and I'm, I was, I'm more than uh, proud that they uh, co-hosted the show with me. But the time has come, as someone said, it's nice to go off when uh, you're on top. And I don't know if we were on top or not, but, <laughs> but we did have a hell of a good pretend. run. Uh, and when, when I first started this, I talked to the... Uh, uh, the director and uh, uh, I don't know what you would call Adam, but the boss, I'll just call him the boss of GTD sir. Studio, sir. Yep. Uh, and we talked about having a show where I would just sit and talk to people. Uh, and I said, you know what? I've never done that. And I think I'm going to take this opportunity uh, on the last show to do it by myself. So it, yeah, it's a little bit selfish, but I just wanted to see if I can do it. Mm -hmm. So I had to decide uh, who I wanted to bring. And the first guy that came to mind is my brother, uh, John McElveen. Uh, this will probably be your sixth or seventh time on the it's show. It's been a few. I, it's I been a few. Count. I'm old. Yeah. I don't remember. Uh, and, and I just love the guy to death. Uh, and the, the second person I thought was Ed, Ed Kurtz. He's, that's me. That's you. That's yeah. 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 Handsome Ed Kurtz. I'm very handsome. Yeah. You are very handsome. He's very Kurt, too. Oh, no, very what? Nice. Kurtz. Yeah. Kurt? Yeah. So Kurt, so Kurt's it hurts. Yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> this is the kind of show it's going to be, yes. folks. <laughs> uh, I did promise Ed that uh, he would be on the show, but then we stopped it. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, man, that's not fair. Uh, so we had this last show, and I thought of you uh, right after John. I said, let's see if I can get Ed on here. Uh, he's such a fantastic writer. Uh, Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. But you're a nice guy, too. Uh, and Thank you again. Oh, geez. and you're kind of new to the area. I don't know how long you've been here now. Is it uh, less than a year? Less than a less year. Than a year yeah. Jeez, and you're li he's living in Connecticut. He came two and a half hours uh, to come down here to, mm -hmm. to see us, and I'm just tickled pink. So, you know, welcome to the uh, show. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, let's let's start with you. We'll, oh, again, we're going to be very <laughs> casual here. We're going to be talking for about 45, 50 minutes. Give us a little bit of your background. Where are you from? And you know, tell us a little bit about your childhood. My childhood. Yeah. <laughs> Go all the way back. <laughs> oh my God. Um, well, I'm from the South. South? I, I grew up in Virginia and Arkansas. Oh, okay. Um, so a lot of my stuff reflects that. Yeah. A lot of my stuff takes place in the South. Yeah. Um, spent most of my adult life in Texas. Oh, really? So. How'd you go from Arkansas to Texas? Um, west. <laughs> <laughs> Train. <laughs> wow. I got on a bicycle and drive. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, I, uh, I moved out to, to Texas uh, at the turn of the century. It's kind of a weird thing that we say that now, isn't it? It's not that long turn ago, of the, but turn you're of the millennium. Yeah. Turn of the millennium. That's yeah. even better. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and uh, I was out there till uh, into 2015. Went to Minnesota for a couple of years, and uh -huh. yep. now I'm here. When did you start writing? Um, seriously? Yeah. Like professionally? Yeah. Um, 2000. 10, 2011, probably. Well, wow, that's not that long ago. You've done yeah. Well. yeah. Yeah, you've done very well. How many books you got out? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I went online to look. He's got a lot of yeah. books out. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I really, I don't know how many I've written. And I don't know how many I have out because uh -huh. I don't count these things and I have a very poor short term memory. But um, yeah, a bunch. Got uh, a bunch more coming. A lot of them I, I thought were, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, novellas. I've, I've done quite a lot of novellas. Um, I, I have a couple that are going to be coming back hopefully this year. Um, they're older ones. We were talking about Freight earlier. Yeah. Um, Which is a great no Someone else talked about it, uh, I think, today. Yeah, today yeah. Uh, the, uh, Diane Boucher. Yeah. That, you know, and, uh, and my Western novella, Wind of Knives, should be coming back. By that sounds this interesting, year. yeah. Uh, I think it's the best thing I've ever written. Really? Yeah. Is Who's that coming out with? Uh, uh, Down and Out. Down and Out. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah, out of Florida. So... Um, and then this new one, At the Mercy of Beasts, available at your fine <laughs> book retailers. This is three novellas. Yep. Oh. Yeah, I've started that, and I'm enjoying it quite Thank a you. bit. Yeah. It's, it's by far my favorite format to write in. How come? Um, because it's the perfect length. Um, I, uh, I personally have a pretty short attention span. 
when I when I see a book that's that's <laughs> seven hundred pages, I'm just going. I have a hard time keeping on to two hundred thousand words. He's the opposite. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, to me it's perfect. Um, I mean, my next book that's coming out is is almost two hundred thousand words, um, and I feel guilty pushing that on people because I'm thinking I'd, that that'd be a hard sell for me to okay. read. Yeah. You got a back up. You got a book coming out with two hundred thousand words. You're uh, working on it. It's, it comes out in July, actually. It's coming out for Nikon. 200,000 words. It's, it's about 180, I think. What's it called? Sawbones. Oh, you said that earlier. Yeah. Sawbones. Yeah. you got to tell us what it's about. I will tell you what it's about. Yeah. About a doctor? Uh, well, it's about somebody who uh, claims to be a doctor ah, and, is, right. and is full of it. Um, it's a first-person uh, uh, narrative, a very unreliable, uh, unstable narrator. Uh, begins right after the war in 1865. Okay. Um, and uh, an our humble narrator uh, by the name of Septimus Whitehall uh, is holding, uh, he has a list of names and he holds these people responsible. Decept, what was his name? Sept Septimus, Septimus okay. Whitehall, yeah. yeah. And, um, and he's gonna kill these people. Uh, he holds them responsible for the death of uh, the love of his life. Uh. And he is making his way from one end of the country to the far reaches of the West to find them and kill them. As does he, he tells the story. pose as a doctor? Or? He does pose as a doctor. And oh. he even uh, engages in a little uh, little surgery from time to time. <laughs> Boy, this sounds really interesting, doesn't it? Jeez. I love Westerns. Uh, yes. uh, Boy, you share a, a, a little bit with him where historical fiction, because Gone North was just 200,000 words? Yeah, well, it was 225. I managed to get it down to about 160. 160. Yes, I had to trim it, and every, every word was a painful clipping. But uh. Let's talk about Gone North for a minute. We'll come back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, Tell us about it. You've told us. You talked about it before. Uh, yeah, I've talked. It's a uh, it's a period piece for. Uh, it takes place six months in 1961. It's uh, about two sisters in New Orleans. Um, one's 19, Emma's 19, and Talia is 16. Mm -hmm. And in a what seems a uh, twist of fate, a good twist of fate. The older sister gets offered a chance to go to Boston to work for a prominent family in the Boston area and also to be able to attend Leslie College, which in 1961 was one of very few colleges, actually the only college to openly accept um, black women. And um, <clears throat> so she sets up in Boston and everything is very nice. and but. Once she's in Boston, tragedy happens back home in New Orleans and um, it claims the life of her parents. And um, she feels that this is in part penance for her moving and trying to get a better life. Um, meanwhile, back south, her younger sister, Talia, is um, forced to live with her grandfather and uncle. Yeah. And uncle's not a very nice guy. And um, shortly down the road, an altercation happens. And brutal altercation. Brutal yeah. altercation. Um, so Talia feels that her only chance of having any kind of life is to be back with her family, which is her sister in Boston, and decides she's going to walk from New Orleans to Boston with her three-legged German Shepherd and um, a duffel bag full of goods, and she has no idea what she's in store for. A road trip for a, a young, road, young girl. For a 16-year-old black woman in 1961. Uh, fortunately, there is a person who ends up um, noticing her and decides he's going to play guardian angel for her as she's walking home. His name is, he goes by the name of Nash Rambler. Yeah. Because um, some car. Yes, the yeah. old car, and something happened in his past, which feels he feels he's a black man that um, lost his daughter, and so he feels that she would have been about the same age as Talia, so he feels responsible for her, and he he comes in and out of her life though. He doesn't quite stay a, with her the whole time. No, he doesn't. Yeah. He doesn't. But he's you know he's always nearby, yeah. and um, so. 
the story goes from there. As, as I said, it's a very thick story. It's a lot, been, a lot of lot. Uh, different uh, meetings with people. Yes, and yes. Of scary. Um, uh, she meets a lot of really nasty people, but she also meets some good people along the way. Um, one of them being an old um, concentration camp survivor who um, feels a certain solidarity with her and helps her out as well and and the sister in boston doesn't have it that much easier she doesn't have it much easier too because um unfortunately well she does the um she starts a relationship with well they both start the relationship the son of the prominent family who's white who's white yeah. and he's uh very much fallen for her and vice versa and Marty. Of course, yes, Marty. Marty yeah. Very good, good memory. And he's, um, they, they've got this altruistic view that, you know, you, you know, love will get you through. But in 1961 Boston, it doesn't work that easily, especially if you're in um, the, the prominent areas, um, you know, in the Cambridge area especially. Um, <laughs> That's in, true in yeah. 2018. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're right, you're right. So anyways, um, I have to, not to give too much away on it, but um, it's, it's an exciting book. It's it got is. some yeah. really good feedback. Yeah. And oh, my God, I'm sold. Yeah. yeah. It was interesting. I, I, I think I read it maybe a year ago now. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah wow, it has yeah. changed a bit since then has because it? I did thin it out some. Yeah. And, um, but as I was saying, I just watched, um, and whoever's watching this, go to Google.com and look for uh, post-traumatic slave syndrome. And there's a Dr. Joyce Ch Chan, Chan, I think it's, uh, she's an African-American woman. She's a psycho, psych, psychiatrist with like five degrees. And she, boy, did she open my eyes. Wow. Um, yeah, you said you wanted to go back and change. I wanted to go home. back and rewrite a lot of this book because holy moly, what we don't know, yeah. you know, and, and she has this view of, you know, of what's happening back then and today and how it's continued through the years. Mm -hmm. But let's let's talk a little bit about you since you're, you're on a roll here. Uh, <laughs> what's your childhood like? Where'd you grow up? Um, I grew up well right here in uh, Nashua, New Hampshire. I was born in Nashua, so I'm not far from here. Um, but I was raised in um, between Hudson, which is a bedroom town, kind of like Goffstown to Manchester. Manchester yeah. yeah, Hudson is. And um, uh, summers were always spent down in Hampton Beach. So I had, um, from a child's view, a, a pretty good life. Uh, you know, I thought, you know, um, my mother loved us very much, but she was definitely a domineering, you know, she, she demanded a lot. Um, my father was very loving. He was more like, um, I, in fact, I use it in the book, is where um, my father, protected my mother directed and so but life was good I was a clown I mean, I, from from the day I think I came out with a yeah, red nose and, yeah <laughs> and uh, yeah in class uh, I went to parochial school um, I had been suspended I got suspended in the first grade uh, <laughs> first grade <laughs> wow. um, yeah yeah we got us uh, for a few days on that one um, and I was never a troublemaker but I, I was I was rambunctious, and I had a couple friends, Scott Dyer and Dan Duran. They called us the Three Stooges, of course, because uh, we had a lot of fun. I'm sure you and, did. Um, yeah. So, but uh, oh, I've got tales to tell about school. Someday I should write them. But um, and, but in fact, our sixth grade teacher, who was one of probably one of the most beautiful nuns you'd ever see, she had amazing eyes, and and but uh, she had all three of us in class. But a couple of years after I got out of that school and I started working, I was a, um, a uh, what do you call it, aisleman, stock the, stock the aisles in the grocery Stockwell. store. So this very nice looking woman comes by and says, hi, John. And I said, you know, I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> you know you're 15 and I say, whoa. You know. But, um, and she says, you don't remember me, do you? And I said, um, no, but I, you know, and I, you're familiar, these vivid like, blue yeah. eyes, and she goes, uh, Sister Rita, and I said, oh. you know, is I was she like, whoa, sister? She, no, she, oh. and, and she said, no, I'm not there anymore, and of course me, I said, oh, you kicked the habit, but, <laughs> <laughs> and, and she goes, and she told us, she said, you know, we had to be um, reserved, and, you know, and we had to reprimand you, she said, but you, Scott, and Dan were the reason I loved going into school ah, every good, day, was, good. 
That's a great you know, memory. Yeah, yeah. So. How about you? Well, any school stories, uh, childhood <laughs> stories, school stories? My childhood was garbage. <laughs> <laughs> it, it all goes into the books, man. Writing for it. Yeah. Well, that's a good place to put it. Yeah. yeah I mean, I went to, gosh, I, went, I did high school and public schools in Arkansas. I mean, it, you know, yeah, if you've got a, like, yeah, if you've got uh, a yeah. pulse, they'll they'll yeah. put you through the system, you know. But I mean, it's, you know, Little Rock in the uh, in the early late '80s, early '90s was the uh, per capita, the right. murder capital of the oh, country. Jeez. Oh, wow. I mean, it was it was a pretty. No wonder you wanted to get out. Kind of rough little place there. Um, so I mean, if 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 kids weren't stabbing each other, that was kind of their so their they focus. Their spare time. <laughs> you know, education was not number yeah. one. <laughs> you know? Holy cow! Jeez. How about uh, jobs? When you, you know, what would you do for jobs? Uh, oh gosh, I've done years? all kinds of different things. But um, I spent several years um, doing uh, the hotel night management yeah. Yeah. stuff. Uh-huh. You've had some great stories. I've got a lot of stories. Uh, give us one, just <laughs> quick tease. <Uh-oh. laughs> um, I don't know. There's, 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 you know, been a couple of deaths along the way. Number of naked people. Mm-hmm. No, that's to be expected. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, when they come down into the lobby, mm-hmm. stark, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the, the toilet's not working. Yeah. 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 No. There's no hot water. Um, gosh, I mean, how how X-rated do we get here? Not. No. no. Yeah. 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 This is a respectable yeah. show. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, there's been some stuff. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. I've dealt with a lot of very interesting people, and... Uh, What's funny about that is be- because hotels f- feature in a lot of my fiction, mm-hmm. um, everybody always assumes that that came from that experience. Mm-hmm. I have not written any hotel fiction since I did that. All of that was written before. before. And yeah. it turns out I was right. <laughs> I got it right. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Actually, my, my electrician career started in, uh, in the Sheraton Tower down in Nashville. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I was an apprentice there. Oh, wow. Yeah, Lars, who ceilings and whatnot. But, that's a nice hotel. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. But, so we have that in common. We're, but I'm, uh, I actually never really wrote anything about a hotel except my, for my novel Experienced is a lot of it takes place in hotels. Hmm. Now uh, you've told me about this, but this is the one with the uh, the kids. The is that? No, this is on. Th- this one is about a new uh, a, a new type of ecstasy. No, you which didn't tell okay, me that. I'll tell okay. you about it later. But uh, <laughs> because it's really involved, but yeah, I think it's something really. I I haven't seen anything like that this out there, so that's why I grabbed a hold of it. I, I want to talk about. Uh, books that both of you guys have written and just tell us a little bit about it but I'm kind of go into the background on the books and you know uh, you like I, you've got a great story on on rib uh, and, and to me that story was the name change yeah. you know and uh, you know first tell us a little bit about the rib that changed the world uh, what it's about and then tell us what you were thinking or how you put it together sure. and then tell us about the, the name change okay um, it's kind of common for me when I finally get in into the zone where I'm, I'm writing the novel that I'm, I'm taking from different things that I've wanted to write about and blending them mm-hmm. um, I knew I wanted to write something that was World War II era but set in the US I knew I wanted to write about uh, hygiene pictures and the hygiene roadshow stuff because I'm a, it's a phenomenal story. Mm-hmm. I mean, subject matter. Oh, it is to me. <coughs> and um, my my greatest sort of hobby and passion in life is uh, exploitation cinema. Mm-hmm. And it occurred to me that I know a lot of really fascinating things that most people have never heard of. <laughs> I should be writing about this. And the hygiene picture was a, was a big one. Yeah. This was this was how independent uh, producers in the 30s and 40s and 50s got around censorship, like really strong censorship uh, regulations, by claiming that they were educational, and so they could be a little risque and a yeah. lot more risque lot by saying oh, it's yeah. educational, uh, and they would have fake doctors and fake. You know, professors. There's Which is all in the book. It's a yeah. fascinating book. Come in and do a little lecture and sell literature yeah. and whatever. But, yeah, that, that went into the book. And um, 
but I also wanted to write about uh, carnivals and magic. All of that stuff goes on there. So th these were all disparate sort of themes just kind of hanging in the head um, that sort of gravitating to each other <laughs> eventually before coming, like, ah, I have a plot. Yeah. And it worked. I mean, you made this one. It's a freaky story. I mean, it's titillating and it's freaky and it's fun. And the ending is existential. I mean, yeah. it's just, it, you know, you got to really sit and think about the ending. But tell us, what was the original name of the... Um, the original title, and, and this isn't the first time this has happened to me, um, when I when I sold it to Cheezine, um, I said, you know, one of the first things I said was, okay, this says The Devil's Circus on it. It's a lousy title. I know it's a lousy title. It's a placeholder. Uh-huh. Um, Brett Savory uh, with Cheezine later comes back to me and says, what do you think about the rib from which I remake the world? I thought, wow, that's wonderful. That's a great title. Let's do it. And then I spent the next year telling the story that when they, people asked me, where'd you come up with that title? I said, I, I didn't. <laughs> Brett Savory came up with it. Until Gam... My partner, uh, Dung Jai Gam, wonderful writer, uh, pointed out to me, that's a line from the book. You did I come up with that. that. <laughs> wow, I did not remember that. Neither did I. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I can reclaim that title. That's why we have these kind. women to keep yeah. us in mind. Yes. Uh, wow, that's, that is good. I don't remember writing that, but that's wow. good. The title is fantastic. The line is fantastic. Yes. I mean, it's just an eye grabber. You go, whoa, you know, and you stop and you have to look at it. Thank you. Yeah. And the uh, cover was good. They just did a great job with that book. Oh, it's a gorgeous book. Yeah. Yeah. Really gorgeous book. And it really put you on the map. I mean, that's, that's it what did. you know. It did, yeah. I'd, I'd been hanging around under the shadows there <laughs> yeah. for a few years, but that one Well, that one and we'll get out. to Bleed in a minute, because I think Bleed also has done pretty well for you. It has. Yeah. Uh, but let's talk about Hanaware. We've talked a lot about Hanaware. Let's talk about it again. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's what you're known for, basically, Hanaware. Really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, well, Hanaware is just... Um, I mean, as far as novels go. Yeah. Yeah, because it's my only novel. That's what I mean, yeah. 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 Um, well, be, what, what is the... Well, being a father of many daughters, um, you'll notice that daughters take place in most... A lot of my stories, I won't say most of them. Uh, um, how many daughters is many? Uh, well, I have five. Five. <laughs> and a wife. And, um, and a wife and a stepdaughter and a stepson. But, um, yeah, so, um, but uh, Hanover was also, I've always, um, always been an advocate for, well, not for, but against bullying, against yeah. abuse of any kind, animals, women, children. Bully. You know, yeah. yeah. And so um, this is my little tale about um, two sisters again, um, but these are twins, Hannah and Anna, who um, witnessed the death of their mother at the hands of a very abusive boyfriend. And these girls, because of earlier, witnessing earlier abuse had the ability to dissociate, which most people who are abused or witness abuse learn to eliminate themselves from that's how they cope th that's how they cope yes yeah. you create your little world you hide there um, but after the trauma of their mothers they take it a level higher and um, they literally they to the point of astral travel mm -hmm. and that's how they escape but um, then they go to they go to well they each had their place Hannah had Hannah where and Anna had Anna place and that's their mother had taught them to name these places because that way they associate and makes going there easier. But um, in the story, Anna becomes stuck in Anna Place. And Hannah has the ability to come back, but she um, gets the help of a social worker named Debbie. Um, and to try and help figure out why Anna can't come back from her place. Um, and Debbie uh, is very strongly based on an actual person who went through all the traumas that Debbie went through in this book. 
Um, I Somebody had, you know. Someone I know, yes. And I had asked her if I, I can tell her tale without using her name. And she said, she was hesitant. Then she thought, she said, you know, this will be probably therapeutic, you know. Yeah, and she gave me the okay. And after she read it, she said, wow, that was tough. Mm -hmm. But she said, I needed that. So, and, you know, and she's okay with it now. She's There's a, 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 a theme of trust that runs through that whole book that's just amazing. Yeah, but that's, you know, what do we have if we don't have trust? You yeah. know, somewhere along the line. And yeah. yeah, and they have to open themselves up. And, you know, after being closed for so long, especially dealing with people they don't know or people yeah. they don't trust, yeah. you, you're you forced to open yourself up if you want, it, you want help. Yeah. But, and the ending yes. of that's pretty powerful, too. Um, oh, the the first ending or the, the second? First ending. The, okay, <laughs> first okay. Ending, yeah. yes, because there's a little um, afterwards on that that um, a lot of people like. Yep. And other. Oh no, I liked yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I did like it. Yeah. So, so yeah. like Stephen King, you know, he'll finish a book, but then I'll go on for another few yeah. chapters, you know, <laughs> detailing what happened afterwards. Yeah, I have a sequel all planned out. Oh wow. Okay, um, it's a little further on with Hannah and. Um, deals with some similar, you know, not similar, but a, a, a different set of circumstances, but it's, um, it, it, it's brutal. Oh, <laughs> but, okay. but it's well, good. We'll yeah, look I, think it, I think it'll be a good story. This is on top of the other three novels that you've completed in? Well, Corruption, um, I'm work, uh, Elephant in the End Zone, which is a YA, um, uh, Experienced, I've been working on the kids' book, Owen the Apprentice Troll. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of <laughs> We'll talk about Bleed, then I'll get to, her, to, uh, Let's go to Bleed. Uh, Haver House. Bleed, that's a, another unique story, I think, uh, that deserves to be uh, brought up here. I read the book. Uh, it's... Uh, gross? It's gross, yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is a tough book to read. Uh, it's very violent, very gory. It uh, is that. Yeah, but it, it started off a little different, didn't it? Um, how do you mean? Shorter? Uh, well, I, I, it was self-published. Okay, um, so tell us. I, I know nothing about it. This was uh, 10 years ago, I, I think, thereabouts. Um, I knew, I had written three novels already at that time. Um, but I knew nothing about publishing. I had no friends or acquaintances who were writers or editors or in publishing. I'd never been to a convention. I didn't know anything. Um, and so I just put it out. And as I did start to become aware and educated and meet people, I thought, I, I, don't, want, I don't want to do this. Yanked it away. Um, and then spent the next several years having people ask me, whatever happened to Bleed? Um, flash forward to, I don't know, maybe two years ago. Um, I sent it to Journal Stone. And they wanted to do it. And um, and they they, uh, they cleaned it up, you know. <laughs> they, made it, they made it a tighter book. Yeah. Um, and put out the, what I would call the definitive edition of, of that book. But you got a there's a movie, right? Or a there there's a um, a web series, web series, which okay. I think is sort of in limbo now. I'm not. I mean, it's winning all these awards at um, film festivals all over the world. So hopefully that will uh, that will spur the distributor to want to do more. But um, and pay you? Hmm? And pay you? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, the uh, the the director did a kind of a curious thing with it, where it's a pilot. But it's broken into three individual chapters, okay. so sort of a three-part pilot, um, and that's that's available. I mean, that, that can be watched. It's called uh, Sika S E E K A TV, okay. and that, you can get that on Roku or on the internet, yeah. and it's it's pretty neat. Just a synopsis without getting too uh, explicit. It, uh, the story is about a, a, a fellow named uh, Walt Blackmore, who has purchased a gable front house, an old house um, built in the early 20th century that needs a lot of work. And, and, uh, he's spending his summer before beginning his career as an English high school English teacher uh, renovating this home or working on this home. 
And in the, uh, in the process of doing that, a stain appears on the ceiling in the, in the hallway outside of his bedroom. And he can't do anything to clean up this thing. He can't paint over it. It just seeps through. He goes into the attic and find no cause for, no cause for this thing. But it just keeps getting worse uh, until it starts to develop animal characteristics and is hungry. And Walt makes the uh, ill-advised decision that uh, he's going to take responsibility for this thing. In the meantime, he's got a fiance, I think. He's got uh, a, a new uh, fiance, his yeah. girlfriend, um, Amanda, who um, is very aware that uh, there's changes taking place in Walt <laughs> as he becomes more attached to this thing growing in his house than he is to her. Um, and in a lot of ways, the book is really about toxic masculinity mm -hmm. um, in its many different guises. Uh, you know, Walt is, is the sort of nerdy bookworm guy, but it's, he's he's a very toxic guy. Yeah. And this and uh, one thing I hear a lot, and sometimes as a complaint, and sometimes not, about that book is that we don't know anything about Walt's life prior to the beginning of the book. That's true. Yeah, you don't know a thing about his life mm -hmm. or his background, other than he has this sister. You do meet his sister. Um, that's very intentional. He's a blank slate mm -hmm. when, when we come to him. So there's no sympathy. There's, you're starting just, there he is. Mm -hmm. You make out, make out uh, you know, make whatever you want out of him, but that's what he is. Well, I, I give you uh, some, some flash impressions of sort of a charming. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, yes, you do. Goofy, yeah. bookworm mm -hmm. guy. And then I take that away because he's, it, it doesn't take very much for that switch to get flipped in him. No, it doesn't. In, <laughs> he gets in this, I'll call him a monster because I don't know what yeah. else to call it. It was quite inventive. You did a really good job <laughs> with your monster. Yeah. Yes, Gwen. Yeah, you did a good job. Thank you. Let's go to Hanover House. Hanover House. Uh, Haverhill House. Yes. Hanover House is a restaurant in Manchester. Yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> is it still around? No, no. Uh, uh, that was just Chop House now, I think. Um, Remember Anton's? Yeah, I do. Oh, man, that was so good. <laughs> There's a, a lot of good restaurants in yeah. Manchester that, that aren't there anymore, but let's talk about uh, Haverhill House. Yes. You've got nine projects coming up? More than that. More than that? Yeah, but that's what I'm, that's what are, um, are written in stone. There's quite a bit more. I've got an end, endless influx of manuscripts and um, especially since I'm not, you know, I don't deal just with genre. I'm, I've got a, a, a contemporary, a very interesting book, contemporary romance, I guess you'd call it, but it deals with a, um, a woman named Erin. The book's called Erin's Daughters, and it's, um, it's a good study of Ireland. It's a good study of women, um, of romance. It's just a really well-written, fun book. And no, is this by a woman, a uh, woman no, author? No, this is by a man, Michael a man. Mannion. Yes. Really? Yes. Um, we have another one called um, um, "Invisible Chains" by Michelle Renee Lane, and it's a slave narrative slash vampire slash werewolf slash. It's just that's this, a genre novel. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it's definitely a genre novel, and it's almost like. Um, yeah, it's just a very, it's got this um, like alternate plane circus in it. And um, it's really. Sounds like fun. It's really fun. Yeah. It, and uh, it, it feels a little bit gaming-ish, you know, it has a little gaming feel to it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a slave narrative. And so it's really an interesting uh, concept I haven't seen oh, before. Oh, well, you just sold me. And, you yeah, said it's like Gaiman, uh, Neil Gaiman. Yeah, yeah, and she, uh, Michelle is this wonderful woman I met at StokerCon and she pitched the novel to me and I, it was just like, wow, you know, <laughs> send it along, I want to read that. I want to look at that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, well, that's two. That's yeah, two. Um, well, there's a lot of things. You've got Jeff Strand's uh, Cyclops Road is going to come out in a limited. Is that a re, um, reissue? Is that well, he's only had it in a paperback and um, 
ebook. Uh, ebook, but for the collecting soul, um, and Jeff, a lot of people collect Jeff. And yeah. They really like his. Um, so we'll be doing that. Chris Golden's. Um, uh, I just went blank. <laughs> That's what um, he thinks of you. The ocean dark. Oh, okay. <laughs> the ocean dark. Thank you. Well, while I've got that, and um, and his um. The, the boys are back in town. Oh, geez, I yeah. want to read that. I, yeah. I'm looking but forward to that. The Ocean Dark is going to be a limited hardcover because it only came out in a mass market paperback. Ah, okay. And so we've, uh, what else? James Moore's that's Slices. Six. That's seven. Um, uh, Matt Bechtel's working on something. We have to get some of the details out of it. It's, um, he's written it. It's a, I don't know how much I guess it. It's um, Blood on the Tracks, Bob Dylan's. Yeah, um, the song, yeah. It's album. Okay. He oh, wrote the album, I'm sorry. A You're collection right, yeah. of stories based on that album. That album. Now, there's certain, we've got to find the ways, you know, um, like um, Postscript, uh, Peter Crowther did a similar one based on Springsteen's. And though we can't, you know, Bob Keys Dylan. the words. And, you well, know. you can. But there's a you know there's certain things you got to meet or not meet so we're working on that but um, you know Matt's got a certain definitely a voice mm -hmm. and oh he uh, sure does yeah. yeah and now you're up to eight. another um, uh, <laughs> um, well we, we <laughs> definitely have Tony's book which uh, we just got the proofs in and so any reviewers out there looking for uh, Yep, contact John or myself. Con yeah, yeah, me or Tony. Um, or me, but I won't yeah. know anything about it. So this is a <laughs> th this is a rather grueling um, uh, ghost story possession novel um, with a Catholic slant. <laughs> uh, deals with three ex uh, excommunicated nuns. And a priest, he, he's, he's also excommunicated. No, he's no, not. He's, he's not. still he's there. Not. Yeah. That's right. And um, named after a certain person that you'd recognize, um, Bracken McLeod. <laughs> <laughs> and Bracken just and wrote, Bracken just wrote yeah. an intro to it. Which is and, uh, had me yes. in tears. He's a wonderful man. He is. Yeah. He is. And so it, this is a fun, a lot of fun. A really fun novel. Oh, thank you. And yeah. um, it comes with a bonus short story that, on inspired, the hardcover. Inspired writing. Yeah, no, the, well, the hardcover will. It's, it's yes. the, uh, the bonus story yeah. was written first. Yes, yes. Uh, and it was, it contains a character that's in this, yeah. in the Morehouse, and it kind of weaves guy. its way. It's a big guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, there's actually a series of stories on mm -hmm. one of the incidental characters in here called the pawn shop uh, owner. And uh, the pawn shop owner is this mystical man that owns a, a pawn shop in Gosstown. And the, the pawn shop is, uh, it, it can go from location to location mm -hmm. depending on whatever like circumstances. It is, yeah. it, except nobody really, it just shows up somewhere. And everybody accepts it, that's the pawn shop. And he deals in uh, very high-end artifacts, but they're mostly all uh, exotic or mystical or supernatural in nature. But he's got a man that works for him called Rex who's 500 pounds of just giant muscle, yeah. uh, like you. Just a huge man, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> strong as hell. Uh, and Rex kind of works as his enforcer. Rex has his own jaws, but mm -hmm. if the pawn shop owner needs him, Rex works for the pawn shop owner. Yeah, but Rex has kind of an innocence to him, too. That's well, yeah. yeah, he likes, he, I, he, I shouldn't say he likes, he has a soft spot for yeah. women in animals oh, don't we all? <laughs> <laughs> that are abused yes, that are abused yes. yeah yeah I, hopefully later on we'll have some time to uh, read just a little bit or you can read from it if you I'd like you to just a little bit okay. page or two uh, let's go back to you again you said you got a book coming out uh, this July yeah that's uh, bones. and that's the Western and that's Western elements Western elements yeah but that's Huge chunks of it take place in uh, New York war? City and yeah. Boston a, and Mobile, Alabama. And is it a civil war? Right after the war. Right after the war. Yeah. Okay. Ah. Sounds good. I'm trying to transition. I want to make this transition to the question without it being awkward. But how do you write? How did you write Sawbones? I mean, do you get up in the morning? Do you write 
eight hours a day? Do you go back to bed? Do you wake up again? I mean, wait, what's your process? It's, it's changed a lot over the years. Um, it used to be kind of a nine to five thing. Was it? Okay. Um, and then I started working nights and became a, you yeah. know. While you were working. Yeah. yeah. Um, and now it's, it's kind of getting back to sort of a nine to five. But you also have position. a job, right? I mean, you, you work during yeah. the day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but my schedule is, is such that I I can decide when and I want to do what I want to do. So um, I'm working on two novels now. Oh, you are? Yeah. Um, so. What are you working on now? I am working on a Western, which would be my first just flat sure. out Western full length novel. Um, it takes place in Wyoming. And I'm working on a um, really odd, sort of supernatural cult story set against the backdrop of the Detroit soul and R&B scene in the early 60s. Something you mm. know quite a bit about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> my, uh, my other great passion. Yeah. 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 Tell us about your passion. Your used uh, record passion. Oh yeah. I, uh, well I've, I've been very passionate about soul and R&B music for a lot of years and just this past Christmas um, my partner got me a uh, wonderful record player for, for Christmas. And I think she's probably been regretting that ever <laughs> since. Um, because I, I do, I, I, I go, everywhere I go, I'm looking for record shops. Well, you said you went to two before you came here. I went to two uh, yeah. in Manchester today. Yeah. Um, picked up a lot of uh, Diana Ross and a lot of Aretha Franklin. <laughs> oh, good for Love you. Aretha. Yeah. 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 So I've, I've, I don't know. I, I, I've, Probably up to about a hundred soul records now. Oh, that's good. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Good for you. Yeah. I'm just I'm just, I'm just nuts about uh, about classic soul music, and it's similar to what I was talking about with uh, with Rip from which I remake the world. You know, when when I am that interested in a subject, it only makes sense that I would want to write about yep. it. I just have to wait until the time is right. These elements kind yeah. of come into play. And good for you. Yeah. yeah. And you're a big music fan. You love Porcupine Tree. Yes and yes. Yeah, and yes. I love yeah. uh, what they call progressive music. Um, prog rock. Prog rock, prog uh, jazz. Um, um, Modesky, Martin, and Wood. Um, um, yeah, Roberta says everything I listen to sounds like a machine, and it confuses her. So that kind <laughs> of. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, I'll agree with her that there's a very. Uh, it might be the engi engineering. The industrial soul. type sound. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and a lot of it has a very fixed um mm -hmm. you know and which yes is very intricate and a lot of it's based on uh classical but um it's also very electric and as uh, yeah. emerson lake and palmer emerson yeah. lake and palmer too yes it's the one of the shows i went when i was a kid i started going to shows in the late 60s mm -hmm. early 70s and one of the ones that stands out for me to this day is was seeing emerson lake and palmer after they did the um, brain salad surgery album, yeah, they went on tour. Line. Oh, and that yeah. was an unbelievable show. I yeah. mean, I can't remember how long it was. In my mind, it was three hours long, but yeah. who knows what it actually was. Was he but, sticking blades into his keyboards? Oh, he was doing all sorts yeah. of stuff. Yeah. And the drum, drum actually yeah. rotated upside down, the drum kit he was on. And they lifted him up in the oh air, and he's, yeah. and he's floating around up there. and. People don't realize the song Toccata off of Brain Salad Surgery is one of the most intricate drum solos. The, uh, the biggest portion of that song are drums hooked into Keith's synthesizers. Uh -huh. so, oh, really? Yeah, so each of those boop, boop, those dribbles are actually uh, Carl Palmer smacking one of his oh, drums wow. and it's tied into the, uh, hmm. the uh, synthesizer. So it's it's really, so now next time you listen to it. I'll listen. Yeah, feature double features uh, theme. Yeah. Um, yeah, the I'll first listen. concert, well, it wasn't actually the first concert, but my brother brought me to a concert for my birthday in 1971. And it was, um, yes, opening for Jethro Tull. Oh, geez, yeah. Uh, at Hampton Beach. That's at the a casino. odd uh, pairing. Not really. They're both very uh, this and this. Well, I, you know what? Yeah, there are. Now that I think about yeah. it, yeah. I, I no. tend to think of them as uh, uh, the later years and uh, after Aqualung, you know, yeah. Heavy Horses and well, that kind of stuff. What happened that was funny is um, it was Yes's first American tour. And both bands were, you know, 
pretty under the radar. Radar. But that year, Yes came out with um, the Yes album, All Good People, and um, Yours is No Good. That's Huge. Great yep. Yes. And Tal came out with Aqualung. Now, all of a sudden, this little venue, which my brother worked at, oh, so the that's riots. why we got there. Yeah. They get, yeah. The riots, I forgot. Yeah. They were, had seating for just about 2,000 people. Suddenly, seven to 8,000 people wanted to get in there, and they were climbing the walls. Yeah. They were Little did we know, we were inside. So, you know, I saw a couple of guys in the skylight, and I didn't think much of it, you know. But um, outside of you, there's a riot. <laughs> National Guards yeah. there, and people are wow. arrested. I remember I that, mean, yeah. 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 yeah, and so, um, yeah, that was the last concert they had for about six years. Yeah. The casino didn't have another concert until, um, yeah, probably six years wow. later. Then they yeah. came back and started it up again. And it's still a great place. Yes, still love. Um, loves starting their concerts there, their tours, because yeah. they like the sound, the setup, and whatnot. Yeah. And in fact, my brother took me to Yes's first show there, 40 years, almost to the day, 40 years later, I took Laura there to see Yes. Oh, geez. <laughs> At the casino, so it was yeah. kind of neat. <laughs> Father-daughter bonding. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. Yep. I think the, f I'm trying to remember the first concert I ever went to, it was either uh, a big concert. Yeah. It, it was either Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, or, or uh, Allman Brothers. Yeah. Um, those were both the, the fantastic yeah. shows back then. Oh, yeah. That was at Boston Garden. Which it was James cool. Montgomery opening up for uh, Jay Giles. Oh, yeah. yeah. See, Jay Giles used to play in Manchester. They used to play at the small arenas. It was Holman Stadium in Nashville. Holman, okay, yeah. They used to play. Uh, all if you want Jay Giles LPs, Thrifties in Manchester. <laughs> 7,000 of them. They're local, yeah. The yeah. same with Aerosmith yeah. used to play all the yeah, bars the here. School. Yeah, the high school, yeah. yeah. So I used to see those guys. I never, I mean, I, I counted them as concerts, but in my mind, a concert is this big, huge thing. How about you? Would you ever go to shows and listen to music? I'm not listen, but go see music? Uh, I, I do. Uh, unfortunately for me, and this is starting to change now, um, most of the music I've ever been interested in, it was too late. They were dead or they, the they band was up. broken yeah, up, yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm fanatic about the police. Oh, I became okay. fanatic about the police. About six years after they broke up. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was a huge Stuart Copeland fan. Yeah, yeah. yeah things like that. So. Um, and now I hear you're a big Talking Heads fan. I'm a huge Talking Heads fan. We're we're going to Roberta's see. Roberta's uh, favorite. <laughs> oh, I love Talking Heads. We're going to see David Byrne in, in September. I've I've seen him before. He's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and I hear you can't wait for Pearl Jam. <laughs> it'll be it'll be interesting. <laughs> it'll be interesting. That's Gam's. Uh, that's that's. Yeah. yeah, she 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 loves Pearl Jam above all things. Yeah, yes. And we're yeah. we're going to not one but two consecutive wow. Pearl Jam <laughs> concerts. In uh, the old days, you could go to a show for like thirty, forty dollars at the most. Well, that's another one of the reasons I don't do it very yeah. often. I just found out last night that uh, Stevie Wonder, living legend, uh, is doing a very brief, I think, six or eight. Really, I didn't stop that. tour <laughs> later this year. Well. Um, of course I want to go do yeah. that. I also don't want to pay $210 per ticket. Uh, <laughs> I'm a huge Neil Young fan, and he's coming to Boston again. And uh, $267. And he's playing solo. Wow. And, and, yeah, and uh, I'm just like, you know, I'm going to be on a fixed income soon. <laughs> so I just can't spend that kind of money. And I've mm -hmm. seen him 30-something times, yeah. I don't know. Seen him once. That's like me and yes. That's, yeah, I yeah. mean, do you really want to spend that money to see him again? And, no, know. especially since you know Chris Squire passed away two years ago, yeah. three years ago, and uh, John Anderson is no longer on the band, so it's like quasi yes. It's not the same thing. See, I, I do honestly, strongly believe that there should be legal requirements for bands yeah. to change their name when, <laughs> when, f when fundamental members, members yeah. are no longer. The one that gets me is Queen without Freddie Mercury. Yeah, yeah. it's just. <laughs> We've got just a couple minutes left. Oh. Would each of you mind reading one page? One uh, page. Yeah, okay. one page. Just pick a page. You first. Me first. You know, if it goes into the next one a little bit, that's yeah. fine. All right. But pick something that, uh, that that you'd like the audience to hear. All right. That's about a page, isn't it? Yep. All right. This is uh, from the second novella in, uh, At the Mercy of Beasts. Uh, it takes place uh, in the Philippines after the American-Philippine War in the early 20th century. It's called Kennan Road. The mourners were few and scattered. 
A Filipino priest, his head completely bald and slick with sweat, mumbled in Latin over the open grave. On all sides sat squat stone beds that concealed Baguio's dead, already great in number. No one wept. Corporal Houghton lingered at the periphery of the necropolis behind a tall stone cross, from which vantage point he silently observed the solemn proceedings. A lorry coughed and sputtered behind him, and he ignored it. His attention was fixed on an old Pinay woman in a threadbare black dress and shawl. She crossed herself repeatedly, as though in a mania, shook her head, and rocked from side to side. Upon the ritual's end, she was the first to pass by Houghton, where she paused to look upon him. I am sorry, he said, for want of something better. He wondered if she was a relative, perhaps Buko's mother. The old woman curled her upper lip, displaying infrequent teeth. As Wong, she hissed. Careful, you. Careful. Mananangal. Houghton wrinkled his nose and said, I don't understand. English, please. Mananangal, said the woman. And then she was gone. You read so well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I have to follow that up. Um, all right, I'm going to read, as you said, from the prologue. The first little part of it is, It was said that the Moore House had a black soul. Many Goffstown residents would agree. Then again, there were those who considered it irrational that a man-made structure could possess or influence moral character. But if you were to ask the joggers, dog walkers, and kids on bicycles who came within its vicinity, they would not deny that the Moore House intrigued them. While it may have stimulated a specific appetite in the victim, its initial assault, was on each of its tar its initial assault on each of its targets was similar. The Moore House excelled in enticement. It, in, it tempted the uncertain who yearned for conformity. It called to the disaffected whose assurances of acceptance, with assurances of acceptance. We should have had Ed read this. <laughs> I know, yeah, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it, welcomed, no, <laughs> it welcomed the indignant with promises of sanctuary. The structure ex exuded a dominance the weak could not ignore. The strong may fe have felt the stab of guilt, a tug of regret, or an urge toward hostility when they crossed paths with the house. But those feelings were temporary, forgotten almost as quickly as they had appeared once the building was out of sight. The Morehouse soul had an appetite that it usually held at bay, but when the hunger rose, it became voracious. That afternoon, it would feed again. That's great, thank you. Yeah, no, you actually did a pretty good job. <laughs> Considering. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's always hard to read somebody else's work, uh, but I, I. No, it's hard uh, to read my work. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, John is the publisher of the Morehouse. Uh, he's also one of the editors, and I can't thank him enough for his help in putting this together. Uh, this book is. The way it is because of John, uh, he's done well. No, no, no. Job. You wrote the book, and it's a fun, really well, fun book. And thank you. Well I I owe you a lot, and and it's a great you, story. You pushed me to places that I never thought I could go, uh, yeah. and you taught me an awful lot. So. Well, I was taught as well. You know, Rick Howdle, Chris Golden. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, y your comments, every one of them was spot on. Every one of them, and you made me think of things that I'd never thought of. Uh, and like I said, you pushed me to go to places I never would have gone. So, I, I, again, I, I said it, I think, yesterday. My heart isn't big enough to, to accept all the love you gave yeah. me, and I really want to thank you. Oh, well, you're going to pay it forward to someone else. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes, I will. Yeah. I will. Gentlemen, thank you. I hope uh, you enjoy the show. Very much. Very yeah. much. Yeah. yeah, great. And maybe someday in the future, you know, this will happen again. And I just want Ed's voice. <laughs> uh, that's yeah. what I was joking. Yeah. It's his voice that just oh, yeah. captures you. Yeah. It's 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 really. Well, that's good. why I'm gonna start doing audio books. Well, you should. Uh, <laughs> seriously. Yeah. Yeah. I got yeah. I got a couple things up my sleeve. Oh, good, great. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I'm not sure if we ran over on time or not, but uh, no, the director's saying no. I want to take this opportunity to to thank Dave uh, Suter for the last three years. Uh, he's been a, a great director. 
uh, and uh, hopefully I'll be seeing them again. Uh, can't say when, but hopefully it'll, it won't be that long. And thanks to Adam, the boss. Uh, sir. sir. So good night, everybody. Thank you for the Pork Fried Rice Society, uh, the three of us. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll catch you somewhere, somehow. Nikon, no con. Nikon, no con. Yeah. Wherever. We'll be there. We'll be around. Yes. Um, in October. Merrimack Valley. Book Festival. Book Festival, we yeah. got Chris put together a huge event this year. He sure did. Yes. Unbelievable. And they are, um, I mean, from Brian Keene, Jennifer McMahon, from, uh, I, I couldn't, I can't say enough about that. I love her writing. And um, you don't see her around often. She doesn't tour, but she's coming down for the event. And Fantastic. And, Fantastic, yeah. yeah. I'm so looking forward to it. Yeah. Thanks again, everybody, and we'll catch you sometime soon. Yes.